Be me, age seven. Mom left dad for an aging bassist in a shit tear hairband. She ends up ODing on heroin a few years later. Whatever, fuck her. Only child. Dad raises me the best he can. Have no other family, except an uncle that my dad refuses to talk to, and one grandpa in a nursing home. Be 14. Grandpa dies. Dad and uncle both inherit about two million each. Grandpa had a textile company that he sold, if you're wondering how he got rich. Saw uncle around that time, because him and dad had to get all the shit in order with the grandpa situation. He's glad to see me. We talk and catch up a bit. Dad still hates his guts, but he never says why. He just mumbles under his breath as he changes the subject or pretends he needs to go do something around the house. I don't really ask about it anymore, but I did hear that my uncle did good with his money and started buying up land. Fast forward to high school, we find out dad has cancer in his throat. Try to be an optimist, but it does not look good. Use up a lot of money on treatment. I postpone going to college to stay with him so he isn't alone. Ends up dying when I'm 21. I have a little under 10 grand and the house after all is said and done. Work shitty jobs here and there. Get girlfriend. She cheats on me after two years. She lives with me, so I can't kick her out right away. Say fuck it. Take an extended amount of time off from my job and drive off to get away from the situation. Have no one in my life that is close to me now. Feel hopeless and depressed. Drive aimlessly around the country. Hit some famous places along the way. Grand Canyon, etc. See a bunch of tourists with their happy families. Get super lonely. Decide to try and find my uncle. Takes a lot of searching, but eventually I get a number of a guy that keeps an answering machine for my uncle. Apparently, uncle lives off grid in a cabin by himself and doesn't keep a phone or anything like that there. Anyway, don't want to hang around and wait for a call back. Drive to where he lives. Get to the guy's place who keeps uncle's answering machine. Old retired guy, pretty friendly. It's like 10 miles, so the guy lends me an old mountain bike and tells me I can leave my car at his place. I get my bag with all my essentials and thank him before I head out. Start wondering how uncle will react to me dropping in on him after so long. Kinda nervous. Pass a few ponds and small lakes. I can't believe uncle owns all this land. Get to cabin. Uncle is outside and staring at me like a psycho. He seems kinda paranoid. I yell to him and tell him that it's me. He lightens up quite a bit. Seems happy to see me. Get the, you've grown so much didn't recognize you. Get inside, and we start catching up. He makes some food. I tell him my situation. He says I can stay with him for a while. Feels good. Next day we just hang out. I see he has a ton of journals that he has been writing in every day since he was 10. My dad had some too, but he quit after a couple of years. Uncle said I can read them if I don't mind seeing some mildly questionable shit. I guess he was pretty honest when he wrote them. Spend a lot of time reading those journals, learning more about my dad's family. Eventually, I want to get some stuff that my uncle didn't have at his cabin, mainly beer. In the morning, go back to the car and head to the nearest place for some supplies, shitty gas station. Get back and ready to hit the trail again. Old man comes out and I talk to him a bit more. He asks about the family history. Tell him dad and uncle did not get along. He tells me that it might have something to do with the lake disappearance. What disappearance? Apparently, a long time ago, this area was a popular camping and canoeing spot. People would pay like a regular campground and carry their canoes in there. Uncle used to live in a different spot and he would come here every year when he was younger. All guy tells me that one year, a dude disappeared there. His tent was all torn up, and there was blood everywhere. Only of a person on record that was there at the time was my uncle. There was an investigation and everything. My uncle got cleared eventually, and the dude was never found. I asked the dude what he thinks happened, and he says he has no idea, and that I should ask my uncle what happened. This was really unnerving at the time. I figured that this was why my dad broke off contact with my uncle. 
head back to Uncle's with a beer and other goodies. Not gonna lie, that information changed my image of my uncle. Decided not to bring it up right away, but I really want to know what his story is. We drink beer and just hang outside. I ask him if I can take out the canoe the next day. He says sure, but I can only go in specific spots. Don't bother asking why. He starts to make something for us to eat. I sit and read more of his journals. Decide to try and find the journal for the year that the disappearance happened. Start going through it when I get to a spot that had like five pages ripped out, and the way it looked seemed like my uncle had done it recently. All of the other journals that I looked through had all of their pages, so I was pretty sure he did this at some point after I took an interest in the journals. I decide not to bring it up. We eat and hang out some more and go to sleep. The next day, I want to head out in the canoe and paddle around a bit. He gives me some pointers and tells me to stay only on this one lake. Okay, sure. I paddle around for a while, hugging the shore mostly, kind of scared to go deeper in the water. Eventually lose sight of the cabin. It's a nice day, lots of wildlife. I see an odd-looking area offshore. There are a bunch of chopped-down trees, and it's really overgrown, but it looked like something used to be there. I decide to check it out, and find out that it's an old, overgrown trail. Also, it looks like someone tried to cover it up with logs and debris to hide it. Too curious to leave it alone, get out and walk through the thick vegetation. Follow what is left of the trail for about a quarter of a mile, come out to a different lake. It is dead quiet. No wind, no animal sounds, no bugs. Get a super weird feeling, like someone is watching me. Start walking out on the rocky shore. Realize it's way too quiet here. Even the water seemed to be too still. Decide to go back to the canoe and head back to the cabin. Uncle is out and waves to me. Ask me how it was. Tell him it was fun. Ask him about the other lake. His face goes blank as he looks off in that direction. Says he told me not to go to any of our lakes. I tell him I just walked there. I didn't take the canoe over. He tells me to never go there again, or I would have to leave. He tells me he doesn't want me in the canoe again. He seems pissed. Okay, whatever. He disappears for a while. I decide to get more beer. Get back to cabin, and uncle still is not there. I decide to hold off on the beer and make something to eat. Uncle gets back, and he is pretty quiet. Things are kind of tense. I just end up sitting around till bedtime. Next day, Uncle is in a better mood. Apologizes for being a dick. We start drinking beer. He goes through most of them, and loosens up a bit. I guess he really needed to take the edge off. I ask him why Dad and him never got along. He just kind of brushes it off. I ask him if it's to do with the incident on the lake. He gets quiet for a moment and asks me what I know about it. I tell him what the old guy told me. He gets really quiet for a long time and just stares off in the direction of the lake or the overgrown trail. Maybe it was because he was drunk, or maybe it was because he was tired of keeping it to himself, but he told me where he hid the missing journal pages. He got up and went for a walk. I went to the spot in the cabin where he hid the pages and started reading them. First page is from the day before his trip out. It didn't really have anything too interesting on it. Mostly a list of all that he took on his camping trip, and what he ate in the weather, which he documented every day. The next two pages were from the same day. They were about him arriving at the park, hoping he was the first person there that season, so he could camp wherever he wanted. He found out that there was already another guy out in the lakes, who went in the night before. I guess back when the land was a campground, it was a lot easier to access a lot of areas, so it didn't take long to get to the lakes with his canoe. He had a specific lake that he liked to stay at, and he was hoping to have it all to himself, or at least his favorite spot, which was a small island in the lake. When he got onto the lake, he saw smoke on the island and a red tent, so he was disappointed that his spot was taken. Eventually, he settled onto a small peninsula that had some trees on it. The only other noteworthy thing from that day was that he never saw the guy walking around on the island, and eventually, the smoke stopped. 
The last thing on that page was that Uncle planned on moving to a different lake the next day because he wanted to be completely alone. The next day, he noticed that the guy had not lit a fire and he still hadn't seen him walking around on the island and his canoe was still there. There was a storm rolling in that day and my uncle decided to stay at that spot for another night. He also wrote that during the night on his first day, he got up to take a piss. The moon wasn't quite full, but it gave off a lot of light. He saw what looked like a log standing straight up out in the middle of the lake. The last page had two days on it, one on the front, one on the back. The weather was horrible the next day, windy and cloudy. He decided to try and head out anyway, but ended up flipping his canoe and had to get back to the shore. He made a fire and dried out all his gear and clothes the best that he could. He set up his tent again and was in for another night. He also wrote that he still had not seen any movement or a fire on the island and that the night before, he saw, once again, the upright log on the lake. But this time, it had been closer, about half of the way between the first place he saw it and his campsite. He also noted that it was not visible during the day. From what I had read up to that point, I didn't understand what was so bad about this that he would try and hide it from me. That all changed when I read the last entry. The last night, there was moonlight that woke him up. He also had to take a piss. He got out of the tent in the cool night air to complete silence. The only sound was the faintest lapping of water on the shore. As he was relieving himself, he noticed how calm and glassy the lake was, and then he saw it. The thing that he thought was a log stood at the very end of the peninsula. Now that it was on land, he could tell that it was alive, a pitch black figure, almost seven feet tall, wearing what looked like wet robes. He crawled back into his tent, his heart racing, and pretended like it wasn't there. Then he heard the voice of a child in distress. Can you help me? I'm lost. Followed by a low giggling and random whispers around the tent. Shh, don't wake him. Then more giggling. This went on for what seemed like eternity. The sounds of footsteps all around the tent, giggling and shushing. Just before dawn, he heard what he presumed to be the figure wading back out into the water. As soon as it was light out, he was already packing his things and heading back the way he came. But first, he paddled up to the island to see if anyone was there. All he saw were the remains of the first fire, the tent torn apart from one side, blood everywhere, and strange symbols drawn on a big boulder. He reported the missing man, but he never told anyone about what he saw that night. After I was done reading, I just sat there until my uncle got back from his walk. It's still out there, he said, as he looked towards the lake. He said that he bought up the area over the years and tries his best to keep people off of that lake. He says it's cursed. That didn't stop me from going back once more to see it, but that is a story for a different time. I like to think most kids have a fear of clowns, but Mark was always the bravest, and he wanted to prove himself yet again, so he went in alone, turned up the light, and sat in front of the doll, now dangling by his only limb. I can't remember where we dug him out, but he was of another era. We knew that immediately. He had a stuffed cloth head, with bright red yarn emerging from the top, and a garish smile painted on beneath two black button eyes. There was no nose. He wore a frilly black and white costume with a red collar of dolly cloth. When we found him, he had thick, primitive feet with obvious stitching marks, but his hands were little white renderings of delicate porcelain. Fine fingers capped with divots of black fingernail polish. We were eleven, what do you think we did with those porcelain hands? We smashed them under the wheels of our skateboard behind the strip mall near Javi's house. It took a little bit of effort, but once we shattered them, the noise was glorious. We kicked the scattered white shards all over the back lot, hoping that some car would spin by and would pop its tires. Somewhere in that, we named him. Look, Ma, no hands. And eventually, just no hands. 
we took a pair of my mom's linen scissors and cut one of his arms off in a parody of surgery later that night when we got home. Instead of white stuffing, old newspaper fell out of him, mixed with what seemed like sawdust. We pulled his right leg off at some point after that, and by then, it seemed like a good idea to take the other one off too. By now, no hands was looking pretty gnarly, and his creepy smile had taken on some darker tones in our eyes. I grew to hate him, and I said so, and Javi and Mark both emphatically agreed. Then Javi had the idea that we should hang him by the ceiling with his last arm and conduct a seance in the old attic. We had a fair amount of carbonated caffeine and sugar on deck and had just eaten a huge pizza that Javi's mom, who even then I was beginning to notice had shining black hair and thick, muscled thighs that led down to fit, glistening smooth calves, had brought us from Pizza Hut. We all crept up to the attic after she went to bed, and when we got up there, we sat around an old sewing machine on cracked, black plastic folding chairs and hung no hands from a beam overhead. Well, we didn't get much out of it, so I suggested maybe it only worked if we were only with him one on one. The idea of being alone with that doll did scare me, and I thought it would scare them too. But Mark was the bravest of us, and volunteered right away. We went down the creaking, collapsible ladder, and sat down on the floor in the upstairs hallway, and waited. We heard a click as the lights went off. After a while, Mark said in a slow, deliberate way, Fold the ladder up, and close the attic up behind me. And then Mark immediately said no. He came scrambling down, leaping the last third of the ladder and rolling his ankle. He let out a little pain gasp and was up in a flash. Javi and I thought it was hilarious, but Mark was not having it and started to fold the ladder up himself and push the ladder spring door closed in the ceiling. Wait, what about no hands? I asked. Leave him, Mark said to me, his eyes glistening red. That was the first time though that we used a personal pronoun for him. Before that, even after we had named him, we always called him It. That night, Mark demanded we sleep in Javi's room with the door closed instead of the downstairs living room that we normally slept in so that we could watch SNL. I woke up at one point to hear someone tapping quietly on the bedroom door and was about to answer it when Mark wordlessly slid on his ass from a hiding place in the corner to against the door. He then put a single finger to his lips and shook his head. I panned to my confusion with a shrug and an incredulous roll of the head, and he pointed, one, two, three, and Javi himself and I, and then he pointed to his ear. Guys, Mark said from beyond the door. Light shone through from the hallway under the door, a black shape marking a shadow in the center of the doorframe. I had to pee and now the door's locked. I remember thinking Mark had thrown his voice and I was about to open my mouth when he dove over to me and covered my mouth looking over his shoulder at the door. I watched in confusion as a single, porcelain hand started to push its way under the doorframe. It slowly and methodically ran along the doorframe's length. Then it quickly shot back, and the black shadow was gone. I was sure it was an elaborate prank, and I told Mark so in a furious whisper. All he did was start stacking Javi's old Nat Geo's along the bottom of the door. Then he put his head against the magazines and closed his eyes. The next morning, the door opened with some difficulty and Javi's mom was pissed, pushing at the door with her weight until she knocked Mark about and sent the magazines. When did you boys do this? She screamed. Then she pointed at Javi and said something really scary sounding in Spanish, very fast. He responded to her in Spanish and gestured to us and she waved him out. You little bastards better come out here too. We did, and saw that the hallway was covered in white porcelain shards. Javi's mom was wearing slippers, and one of her pale, brown feet was marked livid red with little cuts. None of you boys are ever coming out here again, you hear me? We nodded mutely. And first, you are going to vacuum all this up. I brought your shoes. And she did, and tossed them into Javi's bedroom. But if Abuelita found a mess like this, she'd make you do it barefoot. Right, Javi? Javi nodded. 
We spent the next couple hours cleaning up the porcelain. Once Javi's mom was out of earshot, we began to speculate. I still somehow thought Mark was responsible and said so. He was handling a dustpan, kneeling in a clean spot, and scraping tiny, shiny blades of porcelain into the pan. Then he turned to me and said, I didn't tell you because you won't believe me, but no hands is alive. I shook my head. Even at 11, I was getting pretty tired of the shit. Stop, man, this is a big deal. We got into trouble because of you. Mark continued to speak, untrammeled. His eyes started to glisten red again, and his voice, deeper already than all of ours, started to shake. When I got up there, it was quiet for a long time, and then no hands, he started whispering to me. He told me he used to hang people like me on trees like Christmas candles. He said when we broke his hands, we made a mistake. He said he wasn't used to being strung up, but that was okay. He told me he would string me up too. He said he... He squinted, tears suddenly falling down his cheeks. He said he couldn't abide a half-breed. He asked me who jumped the fence, my mom or my dad. Then he said he would show me how it's done. Mark was sobbing now, barely choking out the words. He started talking to me in my voice. Javi and I didn't know what to believe at this point, but we soon had cause to credit Mark's account. On our way out, Javi's mom unceremoniously dumped no hands on the porch with the rest of our belongings, but now he had his hands again, and everything else besides. On the way home, I carried him a full foot away from my body. Mark refused to even look at him. His black button eyes shined in the morning sun, asking me questions I could only guess at. That garish leer of his was mocking us. Instead of going straight home, we walked through the tangle of brush that led out to Turnpike, and we climbed up onto the scenic overlook. And with one concerted toss, I hefted no hands up and out of the chain overlook bridge and onto the highway. We watched, our fingers gripping the chain link, as a semi-truck struck him in the middle lane and sent up a flurry of old newspaper, sawdust, and porcelain shards. Horns started to sound. No hands went flying up out of a back wheel and flew into the air momentarily before hitting the windshield of a minivan, falling off, trampled by a pickup, before coming to rest in the long grass of the median. We wordlessly walked home after that, and Mark insisted we take a different path than we normally would, so no hands could not follow us. The next time I saw Mark, he was dressed in his best suit, laid up in a mahogany casket, lined with white silk. When we got to school the next day, Monday, we were told that in announcements that an accident had happened and Mark had died. I remember sitting next to Harvey and feeling his hand shoot out and grab my shoulder. We looked at one another, but didn't say anything. When I got home, my parents sat me down, and my dad asked me if I knew what suicide was. I said I did. He said, your friend Mark took his own life yesterday. I asked how he did it, and my mom shook her head. Then I said, did he hang himself? My dad said, how did you know that, son? And I said, I don't know. We spent the next week or two in pure terror, Javi and I. No one would believe us, and we were old enough to know that telling an adult a ridiculous truth is a guaranteed ticket to the district psychiatrist's office. Then one day Javi said to me, I heard Mark outside my window last night. He was saying how much he liked to do the hangman's jig. The fuck, I said. That word still had purchase for us then. I told him to nail his window shut, and we did it one afternoon when his mom was working at the salon. Then I spent the night there, but we didn't hear anything. And eventually, I began to wonder if all of it was something I had imagined or made up. Part of me knew that wasn't true, that I had seen and done all I remembered. But another part of me knew none of it was possible. And if it was possible, it meant bad things. Harvey got sick soon after that. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with him, but when they ran tests, they found ceramic shards in his stomach, and they arrested his mom and took her away. I wanted desperately to explain it to my parents, but what could I do? 
tell them how racist Dahl had somehow fed Harvey the shards of his now not broken porcelain hands. He didn't get better. They admitted him to the hospital and let Harvey's mom free when the ceramic shards kept showing up. Eventually, they diagnosed him with Pika, which I didn't understand then, but do now. It's a mental illness where people eat stuff that isn't food, like bicycles and shit and paper. I told my parents I didn't think Harvey had it, but they patiently explained to me that when Mark died, all of us went a little bit crazy. Mom said, like you, sometimes at night, I still hear you wandering around, talking to yourself in the hallway in your sleep. What do I say? I asked. Mom looked at Dad and said, Oh, we all say strange things when we sleepwalk. Your grandfather had that too. That was 17, maybe 18 years ago now. For a long time, I wondered why I had been spared. But the week before I left home for college, I was going through my closet, packing up, and found a small scrap of yellowing up newsprint. Someone had written on it in black, ashy smears. It said, White children are the best of all. Be they be big or be they be small. I'll forget your little boo-hoo. And one day, you'll forget me too. But I never have. This is quite a long story, though it is most certainly true. If you are patient enough to read it all, I believe you will find the implications quite disturbing. If you are looking for a TLDR, you will have to wait. Let's start with some background. You may refer to me simply as John. At the time of writing, I'm 24 years old and married with a 19-month-old stepson. I grew up in the southeastern US. However, my mother is originally from the north. She became pregnant with me at a very young age and moved here to raise me with the help of my grandfather. Before long, she married the man whom I still consider my true father, and he was very good to us. In fact, I was not aware of the circumstances of my birth until I was 15. I will continue to refer to him simply as my father. Soon after, she became pregnant with the older of my two sisters. My father, for reasons I never know nor care to know, took his own life when I was about four years old. At the time, I did not understand death and thought he would return. Throughout my life, I have had quite a few run-ins with the paranormal, several of which I will refer to later in the story. I have seen what I believe to be apparitions, poltergeist activity, experienced sleep paralysis on many occasions. However, I don't really believe it's much of a paranormal thing. It can be frightening. And on one occasion, I believe I even saw my deceased father. This story, however, will chronicle what I believe to be the most disturbing chain of events I have ever experienced relating to the paranormal and the even more terrifying implications of them. I suppose the best place to begin would be when I moved in with my new roommates, who I will call Ashley and Tom. I had lived on my own before, but I had recently been laid off at my old job and was forced to move back in with my mom and current stepfather. The house my mother lived in at the time was the absolute most consistently haunted place I have ever lived, to the point where things stopped being scary and just got annoying. The most common things were hearing footsteps up and down the stairs above my room all night, every night. We thought it was rats or our dogs at first, but considering the weight and interval between the footsteps, as well as the fact that they would stop as soon as you went to check, I find that very, very hard to believe. The second most common thing was poltergeist activity. Apparently, our ghost disliked fans, so much in fact that any fan not attached to the ceiling would switch itself off. In one instance, an oscillating fan violently slid itself across the kitchen floor, unplugged, and tipped itself over after one of us had turned it back on during dinner. My entire family, including my four stepbrothers, my sisters, my mother, stepfather, and my cousin, all witnessed this happen without explanation. Needless to say, moving away from that awful place and into a poltergeist-free space was just what the doctor ordered. I had been unemployed for around four months when, at long last, I had finally landed a new job at a local manufacturing plant. I had been saving money, looking for somewhere to go other than my parents' place, when one of my co-workers, Ashley, 
who had actually worked with me at my previous job, with and whom I had also shared a short-lived relationship with, offered me a room living with herself and Tom, who had been in a similar situation to me and had moved in the month prior. I agreed and quickly moved into my new, smaller, yet quieter abode. Ashley was an ex maringo not terrible to look at and physically fit, though headstrong, as is characteristic of most jawheads. She owned two full-grown boxer hounds that were essentially her children. If the house was burning down, she may have had a difficult time choosing between saving them or her own mother. Tom was very shy and quiet, not a bad-looking guy, but very awkward, especially with women. He had retained his high school golf kid sense of style, and you could tell with one look into his room, which was adorned with all manner of Tim Burton and Invader Zim memorabilia, among of a generally dark, yet seemingly immature for his age, decor. We all got along quite well, and even got Tom to come out of his shell on occasion, sometimes even taking him to bars with us and trying, unsuccessfully, to get him laid. It didn't take long for Ashley and I to become friends with benefits, as neither of us was looking for a relationship, especially with each other, but still had basic human needs that we could conveniently fill for one another. I learned soon after, however, that Tom had actually asked her out, to which she had denied him, effectively putting him in the friend zone. If I had known this, I would have been more discreet, but it was too late. He wasn't stupid, though I did detect occasional jealousy. It was for the best. She obviously was not his type at all, and she was older than him by several years. Several months passed this way, without incident, until Tom began to get behind on his rent. He had been spending all of his money on pot, and laying out of work to stay home and get high. It soon became apparent that he was showing many signs of depression, and given that he had a history of attempting to take his own life, Ashley decided to give him an ultimatum. She gave him one month to catch up on rent, or to go somewhere else, knowing he would probably go back home with his mother, which was probably a good thing. He began staying the night at his mom's more and more, rarely showing his face at our house, until, finally, we stopped seeing him altogether. He had taken some essentials, but had otherwise left his possessions untouched, so we just left them until he decided to come and get them. After all this happened, things changed. This became apparent when soon after, I had my first experience since the old place. I was driving home from work in my little Toyota pickup truck, around 7 or 8 at night, I'd say, just cruising and enjoying a cigarette. When I pulled into my driveway, I parked and set my e-brake light like always, cut the truck off, and began gathering the stuff I was going to take inside with me. As I did, my truck shifted as if someone were getting out of the bed of it. Instinctively, I looked up into my rearview mirror, only to see, of course, nothing there. At precisely the time I decided it was nothing to worry myself about, my truck quickly jumped forward, as if another car had tapped it from behind. Needless to say, this startled me quite a bit, so I opened the door and eased out, cursing as I dropped my father's zippo onto the concrete in the process. As I knelt down to pick up the marred ladder, the truck again abruptly shifted forward, almost as if harboring aggression towards my presence. Stunned, I remained grounded for a moment as I quickly regained enough composure to pick myself up off the asphalt and sprint inside. As I hurriedly shut and bolted the door behind me, Ashley appeared from her room and inquired as to why my face was so pale. What, you just get bum rushed by a ghost or something? She said. No, stomach just feels like shit from eating Taco Bell again. I lied. Surely I was just being a pussy again, I reasoned with myself. Shit, I'm glad nobody saw me bitch out like that. I thought, I've seen way more fucked up shit than this before, but I couldn't shake the feeling. It was like something was watching me constantly, ducking into cover just in time to escape being caught in my gaze as I scanned the woods outside through the living room window. Eventually, I gathered the valor to venture outside again and gather my left belongings, most importantly, my dad's zippo. I picked it up and inspected it for new damage. Fortunately, it looked as it always had. It was a plain black zippo, and it had a deep dent in the top, with paint flecked off at the edges. I had been told by my mother that this very lighter was in my father's pocket when he shot himself, 
and that the dent had been caused by shrapnel from the bullet breaking up and hitting it. True or not, something had definitely hit it with quite impressive force to dent the lighter in such a way. The damage had not affected the lighter's function, however, and my mother had given it to me as a memento the previous year. Quickly, I inspected the lighter, grabbed my other belongings, and rushed back inside without further incident. After I returned, Ashley decided to go to bed and suggested that I do the same. Needless to say, I did not sleep that night, and my spidey sense was at constant attention. It was a very, very long night. The next day, I got out of bed as soon as it was bright enough to see my bedroom floor, still feeling watched and somewhat paranoid, and, very cautiously, drove to the local Starbucks. I ordered my usual Ice Triple Grande Full Pump Vanilla Extra Drizzle Caramel Macchiato. I used to work at Starbucks, seriously, it's a good drink, and pretty much chucked it down. After I finished, I lit up a cigarette outside and watched the early bird hipsters for a bit before I decided to head back home. When I got there, Ashley met me at the door looking very tired. She informed me that her dogs had been up all night growling and staring at different spots in the room, and that when she did fall asleep, she was woken up by a nightmare, but she could not remember the details. Neither of us had slept, and we were both off, so we decided to remedy the situation with some natural medication. So we went around back and blazed a bit of her leftover stash. It was some good stuff too. It did not take long before we were both out like the dead. Over the course of the next few days, I kept having trouble sleeping due to the constant being watched feeling, and seeing things out of the corner of my eye every five minutes did not help. I had always had insomnia, so it wasn't really anything new. I had functioned in worse shape before. Still, it wasn't pleasant. I had never carried this level of paranoia for so long after an event, and it was beginning to wear on me. The following weekend, I had smoked out earlier in the day, partially to shake the paranoid feeling, and had been vegging out in the recliner, watching nearly a whole season of Spartacus, great show, when Ashley's room door cracks open, and her dogs bolt out of the room like a bat out of hell. Ashley followed, slowly stepping out of her room, looking tired and a bit pale. She flopped down onto the couch at my feet, and in as firm a tone as I'd ever heard from her, she said, we need a blaze, right fucking now. Not wanting to turn down free weed, I obliged and packed her favorite bowl to the brim with the last of her stash. After we finished off the bowl, she explained to me what had happened. She had been having a lucid nightmare about her and her family being chased by these evil-looking black dogs. They had gotten every one of her family but her, and right when they caught her by the throat, she woke up. Feeling like she had been choked, and both her dogs were staring at her, cowering in the corner, whining. The dream had really distressed her, which was saying something. We decided to do some good old-fashioned Google research, and what we came up with was rather disturbing. Everything pointed to these dogs from her dream being hellhounds, and according to the sources we found, most of them stated that their presence was warning of a demon desperately attempting to harm us. This all sounded very B-horror movie to us, but we kept on reading on the stuff we had come across. One thing that stuck out to me in particular was an entry stating that remembering a past life could be a sign of demonic attachment or deception. I had remembered my mother telling me stories about when I was very young and telling her about things that could not have possibly happened at my age. So I called her and asked her about it. She told me that I used to talk about my grandfather's cabbie hat. He always called it a polished cab driver hat, and tell her that I wore the same kind of hat when I worked barefoot in the fields. She also reminded me about a time when I had seen my father after he passed away. This one I remember vividly. I had been playing outside in the woods. They weren't scary woods by any means. It was a rural farmland area, and the woods near our house were not very dense, and I had come across a tall man in what looked like a black spring jacket and blue jeans. When I got closer, he looked at me and smiled. It was Daddy. Finally, after all this time, he had come back, just like I thought. I remember we walked around the woods, 
and talked about nothing in particular for a long time. Eventually, we ended up back at the edge of the woods, near a backyard. I told Daddy to come see Mama with me, but he just shook his head and said, I can't. Being a child, my solution was simple. I'll just bring Mom to you. I ran up to the house and swung the door open, screaming for Mom, smiling, and telling her the great news. Daddy was home, and he was right outside. I remember how much my mom held me and cried. I remember being so confused as to why she was upset. After all, I knew she wanted Dad to come home more than even me. I went back outside after Mom finally let me go to tell him what had happened. I never saw him again. After Mom tearfully retold the story, I told her I loved her and ended the conversation. Armed with renewed memories, I decided to research further and pursue more information about seeing my past father. Yet again, I found entries claiming demonic deception, trying to gain your trust. This hurt my heart. I had just known Dad was the one I saw that day, but could I really have been fooled? Even more pressing, had I been followed since I was a child? Growing up, I had always been terrified of the dark, but not sure why. I remembered once, just before Dad died, laying in bed in the dark and seeing these god-awful, horrifying red eyes coming closer and closer to me. I remembered screaming for help, and my mom telling me that Donny, Donatello, my turtle, I practically had a ninja turtle fetish growing up, would protect me, but I kept freaking out. She says that I was just really sick, to the point that I was hallucinating, but I remembered that it was real to me. It still makes me shudder. All the experiences, the feeling I was being watched, I felt like it was all making too much sense. But why now? Why all of a sudden, like this, was I being targeted? I actually had a good idea. Tom was really into that kind of thing. Maybe he got happy with a Ouija board or something one day and let some kind of bad spirit out, she suggested. So we decided to look through the belongings that he had left. We looked through a bunch of stuff in his closet and found a whole lot of strange things, including some odd candles and incense, a couple of pentagrams, the Ouija board that we thought about, and even a dress. We eventually came across a big, gray CD binder that had a couple of porno mags in it, and some CDs labeled 1 to 8 in Sharpie. Deciding to be nosy, we assumed it had to be porn, and given the weird stuff we had already come across, we wanted to see just how kinky old Tommy Boy really was. It was wrong, I admit, but what we found was informative. We chose a CD at random and popped it into the disk drive of my laptop. It was an audio file, but a very long one, and without any track markers. Curiosity peaked, I clicked the play button, and through my speakers blared the words, Satan's kingdom was stolen from him. What the hell? We both said at the same time. The whole thing was a collection of satanic, specifically Luciferian sermons. Putting two and two together, I decided not to spend the night at home. Almost there. That night, I went to a good friend's house. We'll call him Jim. His father had been a missionary for years, so he knew his dogma pretty well, which was just what I needed. We started talking over a beer about everything that had been going on, trading ideas and theories, and generally shooting the shit. After a while, I began to feel that same paranoia that I had been feeling, but I initially brushed it off, as that sort of feeling you get sometimes when you talk about ghosts and demons, etc. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling. As I was sitting there, listening to him, I sort of zoned out and daydreamed. I guess you'd call it that. This strange beast walking behind the couch Jim was sitting on. It looked shrouded in mist, and the only way I can describe anything close to it is like a storm atronach from Morrowind. After that, I snapped out of it and went to go piss. The feeling had gotten far, far worse now, so much so that I rushed my piss as fast as I could, because I felt vulnerable. At this point, I felt like it was time to let Jim know what was up, so I began saying, Hey man, look, I don't mean to freak you out, but that's when he cut me off and said, I'm way ahead of you, dude. 
so we just listened for a bit. I'm not sure what we were listening for, but it was instinct. We did not hear anything, but the atmosphere in the room just got heavy. It was as if something terrible was imminent, and we knew it. This was when we noticed that it had gotten cold enough in his house to see your own breath. At this point, all I wanted was a cigarette, so I grabbed my letter and was about to be headed towards the sliding glass door that led to the deck when I noticed Jim's expression. He was so pale, and his mouth was just slightly agape, as if he wanted to say something, but couldn't. He was staring towards the door, so I stepped that way, and out of nowhere, I was gripped by this sudden, deep, utterly hopeless, absolute terror, to the point that it sent such a chill down my spine, I literally burst into tears. I was paralyzed, only for a second, but that felt like an eternity. I quickly moved away from that cursed spot, and Jim, thinking on his feet, grabbed his Bible and began reading a passage. I quickly followed suit, reading along with him. I'm not sure what we read, or why we read it, but somehow, it worked. After several minutes of this, the feeling of terror was gone. The air was not thick. We both felt fine. Great, in fact. We even watched The Exorcist after, just for fun. After the movie, Jim went to bed, and I crashed on the couch. I woke up around 9 or 10 a.m. in a sleep paralysis state. It's a pretty common thing for me, so it doesn't really faze me anymore, and I was fully aware of what was going on, so I decided to just wait it out. As I'm laying there, waiting for the paralysis to wear off, something speaks to me. Not with words or an audible voice. Sort of like telepathy, I guess. I can only describe it like a train of thought going through your head that you know is definitely not your own. You can't even articulate it into a language, but you know exactly what it means for feeling alone. And whatever it was said to me this way, if I can't get to you, I'll get to those close to you. And just like that, I was free of paralysis. No fear, no paranoia, just an understanding of what I was just told. Over the next month, Ashley and I simply could not get along. She was constantly grumpy and mean. She kept trying to milk me for money, claiming I owed her rent that I didn't, that kind of thing. Before long, we were no longer friends. So I found my own place, got my shit one day when she was at work, and without notice, moved the fuck out. As I was leaving, I felt that presence again. I ignored it the best I could, but I got the feeling it was happy, in a strange, evil sort of way. A few months pass, and I hear nothing from Ashley. One year later, I found out she's been hospitalized. I'm not sure why and that she had lost her job and her house. Imagine how I felt. I couldn't dare face her with a clear conscience. I have a wife and a stepson now. I still see things out of the corner of my eye sometimes, and I hear strange sounds on the baby monitor every now and again, but not that terrible presence. One thing though, my son has recently become very afraid of the dark. Well, that's it. Let me know if you liked how I wrote it. Keep in mind it is all true, so I can't go making a whole lot of changes to the events that happened without making it based on a true story. I took this job, not necessarily for the money, but to alleviate the boredom I had suffered these last ten months or so. After the accident, I had spent five months in an inpatient facility doing rehab on my leg, Laying in bed one day, I got a visit from my sergeant who told me that the township was cutting positions and they could not justify keeping me on the payroll. That was fine by me because SSI had declared me 30% permanently disabled and cleared me for work, which meant with my partial pension, I could live comfortably for the next 10 years or so unemployed. But you can only spend so much time getting stoned and playing GTA 5. Meanwhile, my sleep schedule was completely fucked. I would wake up around 3pm 
and put around in public. I learned not to wear shorts in the summer because dealing with the heat was nothing like the stares little kids give you when you have a metal bar for a calf. I used to think, lying in the hospital bed, that I would treat it with grace, smile, and tap it when the kids were staring and try and alleviate their discomfort. The first and only time I did that, a five-year-old boy burst into tears and his frantic, worried-looking mother quickly shuttled him out of sight. Going out in public didn't do much for me anyway. I had stopped enjoying the hobbies I had before. I saw a strange flyer stapled to a telephone pole on my morning walk one day. It read, Are you interested in exciting and challenging work? Do you have difficulty getting around, but still have something to contribute? Are you a go-getter? Then this job might be for you. Beneath was no description whatsoever, just a black and white picture of a ski slope at night, with a ski lift's lights illuminating the run, and below that was a phone number. Ask for Teresa, the ad read. I got home and called the number. The man who answered had a scratchy voice that reminded me of the sound a car makes running over gravel. I'm looking for Teresa, I said. Yeah, this is she, he said. Okay, I said. You inquiring about the job, he asked. I could hear a chair squeak on his end, like he had just leaned back. I am, what is it? He explained to me that a prominent developer had acquired a struggling slope about 15 miles away from the city I lived in. They needed two night watchmen, one to stay at the top of the slope in the chairlift control tower, and another at the bottom at the base of the slope. The job required no more, I was told, than merely standing up every hour or so, wandering around the area to ensure there were no trespassers, and filing a nightly report. I asked him if trespassers were common, and he answered me by saying, We get all kinds around here. Everyone wants to eat for free. Okay, I said. When can I start? The first night, I rode the chairlift up in a mildewy black jumpsuit that had been ripped badly at the sleeves. It was cold and dark, and the only light available came from lamps on the occasional support poles that the chairlift ground passed at regular intervals. The snow was a harsh shade of orange from the sodium lamps. There was rust on the chairlift, and it made loud, unsafe-sounding creaking noises. I was not introduced to my counterpart. I was told by Teresa, in actuality, a woman in transition, wearing women's clothes, with long hair and garish pink fingernails, each four inches long, that we would communicate by the radio set up in the control tower. I was given a set of keys, a black mag light, and a clipboard with a shelf of paper in it, each page marked Nocturnal Assay. It appeared to be made out for some kind of mining company, and the sheet asked me about percentages of impurities workplace accidents, and air quality. I was told to fill it out as best as I could. When I got to the top, I had a little trouble getting off of the lift with my leg. I was struggling with my arms to move my rigid metal companion so it would bend, but the cold had made it very tight, and the chairlift was a continuous operation. It continued to move higher and higher, approaching the turning cylinder at the top of the tower. If I didn't get off soon... I would have to go around the tower and drop down on the downslope. I was worried I might fall then. As it was, I just leaned forward with my weight and hoped the snow was soft enough that I would not be too badly banged up. When I hit the snow, I heard a soft clap that echoed across the mountain. I got up and looked around and could not discern its origin. Rubbing snow out of my beard, I stumbled through the powder to a browning metal door brushing flakes of rust off the lock so that I could insert the key. It turned with an enormous effort, and when I pulled on the door, it screeched backwards towards me. Inside, it was totally dark. I wrestled with the key until it came out of the lock, and then I turned on the mag light and walked in. It was a cramped little space. On my right were metal shelves with jumpsuits, some mechanical tools I did not recognize, emergency flares, a first aid kit, black and red painted skis. In front of me was a vestibule leading to a cracked 
and crumbling concrete stairs that went up and turned back for one continuous flight to the top. To the left of me was a bathroom with the door propped open. A yellowing and curled piece of paper. I had to pin it down with my fingers to read it, and it said, Out of order, go outside, in curious blue ink. Peering in, I could see shards of mirror glass on the floor, long brown stains that ran from a small, rectangular window close to the ceiling down along the floor, and two old-style long urinals packed in the corner. The sinks were missing all of their metal fixtures, just holes in gray porcelain embedded in the wall. Nowhere could I find a light switch, but there was a nail with a Coleman hanging underneath it, and turning the switch, I was able to turn it on with a satisfying thwump when the kerosene caught. I made my way up the stairs. Up there, there was a light switch, and I turned it on, and a bank of pink and flicking fluorescence slowly came on, a handful popping and dying before the room was only barely lit by two remaining tube bulbs. There was a big control console in front of me with a number of switches, all of which had, it appeared, been super glued in place. There was a small CB radio plugged into an ancient looking floor socket with a handheld mic and a tuner. Windows and many small square panels surrounded the tower, with all their glass mercifully, and I could see out in every direction. Ahead of me, facing away from the downslope, was a thick forest of white-coated pine and pure blackness besides. I sat down in a squeaky old leather chair with heavy metal arms and radial legs and turned on the radio. I clicked the microphone and called out. After a minute, there came a hash of static and a reply. This is your counterpart. Okay, I said. So what's the deal here? You don't bother me, and I don't bother you. Okay, I said, putting the CB radio down. Outside, I heard another flat clap then. It sounded like a rifle. As if in confirmation of my suspicion, I turned and saw a deer bound out of the forest from behind me, throwing up great explosions of snow as it bounded out into the light of the sodium lamps. But as I got closer, I saw it was not a deer at all. It had impossibly long, stick-like legs, and its body was skinny and furry, and I could see every ridge of bone and muscle within it. Its face was a pinched parody of a deer's with shining red eyes and the snout of a snake and it opened its mouth, showing a glistening sea of jagged, sharp teeth. Another clap threw up more snow beside it, but I still could not see where the shots were coming from. As I watched it leap, maybe eight feet at a time, in long, incongruent jumps, zigging and zagging this way and that, around the tower and bounded down the slope. It turned its head just before it went down and called out. It seemed while making eye contact my name. But it wasn't like a human voice. It was a coarse and thick dog bark of a voice, guttural and primitive, and then it was gone, down the slope. For a moment, I held my breath, and then sat down on the chair and frantically called up the bottom slope. Hey, come in. What? There's some weird animal coming toward you. I think it's dangerous. It looks like a deer, but it's not. Mark it down on the assay. What? The sheet. Okay, I said. I marked it down on the sheet with a sharpie, writing, Strange Dear Monster, under the heading Miscellany. I spent the rest of the night nervously looking out the windows for any hint of movement, but there was none. Snow began to fall and slowly filled in the big hoof prints the deer thing had left behind. I paced back and forth and smoked a few guilty cigarettes tossing them out into a grated metal waste paper basket. I kept wondering how a thing like that could bark out my name. It's not a single one either, it's got some serious syllables, and my family's Armenian. Ultimately, I decided what you would. It was some sort of PTSD or psychic trauma, maybe from the accident. Closing my eyes sometime around four, a few hours before sunrise, I had the familiar nightmare. I'm in the squad car. I'm somewhere down Kenton before 5th. There's all the squalid, decaying crack houses lining the street. All warped, wooden porches 
and Swiss cheese roofs. There's a little boy sitting on a tricycle, missing wheels in the front yard, spinning useless pedals, waving a dandelion. His mother is sitting on the porch in a haze, her feet by a forest of stained liquor bottles and dead smokes. I'm looking over at the kid and the mom, feeling nothing, when I hear brakes squeal in front of me. Ahead of me, at a stop sign, a deer bounds into the street. Curious, dappled white and brown creature, shining in midday, and a car stops dead in the intersection to avoid it. I can't. I'm going about 50 and about to make the shift change. I realize I can't make the stop, but I pull the brakes anyway, my hands moving mechanically. I never remember anything after that. But this time, the patrol car seems to slip onto a road of thick goo, moving slow and throwing up yellow and brown effluvium, coating the car windows and making hissing, brooding noises, slowly devouring the glass and car doors. Ahead of me, the deer is standing on its hind legs, with its front paws gesturing, directing traffic. It looks to me, makes eye contact, and its face changes, and it says my name. I woke up and lit another cigarette and took a piss in the urinal. Fuck that sign. When the sun came up, I radioed down but got no response. I filled out my sheet as best as I could, checking the legal standards box for acceptable parts per million, and then I engaged the chairlift and waited. My back turned to the downslope, looking at the thick forest behind the tower, for the chair to come up. When it was close, I hobbled out of the tower, locked it up, and climbed up in. When I got down, there was a metal box with a lock on its front of the lower tower that simply read, Deposit Sheets Here. I did and then went home. I slept as best as I could with some Xanax that I picked up of my brother-in-law. When I got up around four, I ate some microwave mac and cheese and leafed through an old copy of Popular Mechanics on the kitchen table, and I got up and limped over to my bed and painfully knelt down and drew out the lockbox where I keep the sig. I brought it over to the kitchen and opened it up and stripped it, cleaned it, and chambered some rounds into two clips. Then I loaded a mag, racked around, and stuck it in my waistband behind my winter coat. When I looked in the mirror, it seemed invisible. The second night was my last day of work. When I showed up, Teresa was not even there, but she had warned me I would be expected to carry out the job without supervision. Still, I wanted to know who was in the lower tower just to make sure I was not alone. When I tried my key, it worked, and I let myself in. It was the same layout as the upper tower. I used my flashlight and found my way upstairs. It was devoid of anything useful. No chair, no waste paper basket, no controls, not even a radio. It was a stripped clean desk console with gaping holes where knobs and switches once resided. There were spent shelves littering the floor and little wrappers of energy bars a few bedrolls, and a single round, a free or free that I noticed when I picked it up, standing up on the console. The windows had bullet holes in them. When I went back downstairs, there was not anything on the shelves except for cobwebs and strange, iridescent beetles. Where the bathroom was supposed to be was a locked closet. I tried my key, but it didn't work. Inside, I could hear a soft chittering, and it smelled awful. I went outside and locked the bottom tower back up, wondering maybe if my co-worker managed his position outside. I got on the chairlift and took it up the slope. When I got up, there was a small rabbit, bludgeoned to death in the doorframe, open to the elements. Its head was nearly separated from its body, and blood led from the forest in a spattered path. I cracked the door open with the barrel of the sig and shone my light in. It seemed normal. I kicked the rabbit out of frame, and locked the door behind me, scrupulously checking the downstairs bathroom and shelves before carefully proceeding upstairs. But upstairs, nothing had changed, and I suppose the rabbit was some sort of twisted prank by the trespassers Teresa had warned me about. I took a seat and noted the time on my clipboard sheet. The sun was beginning to set, and I set a pack of spritz on the console, my old zippo, and a couple of cans of Red Bull. It wasn't long, before I began to hear the soft claps again from down the slope. I turned to regard the down slope through the windows, and now 
I could make out pinkish red stabs of light emerging from the bottom tower. The bullet started breaking glass in the upper tower, and I laid flat on the ground. This was stupid, I concluded. I should have just left when I saw those bullets. What the fuck was I thinking? From behind me, somewhere in the pines, I heard that barking cough again. It was saying my name. As I crept over to peer down, I saw it. It was standing on its hind legs and gesturing to the bottom tower, a forked tongue licking in and out of its shiny, toothy mouth. Then it took off, darting down the slope. When I saw it take off, the firing began to pick up, away from me, toward the dear thing. The radio crackled. There's two players on the field. You're on his channel. I heard some other voice hiss. Then the radio stopped. I headed down the stairs and out of the tower. I looked toward the pine forest and did not want to do it. But then the bullets started throwing up snow near me, somewhere from my left, it seemed. So I made as fast as I could in that direction. Gaining the forest, the firing stopped and I could see lit spectral from the snow, a whole family of things, each of them licking and snapping at one another in a good circle, tens of them, stomping and cough barking and rolling around like dogs on the ground. When I got close, they all turned at once and looked at me. I reached for the sig and pulled it up, aiming at one of them. There were so many, I had no way of getting them all. I waited. Then they began to cough my name. I shook my head and shouted at them to shut up. Then, behind me, I heard another cough. Not hunters, I heard it say. I turned and it was right there, in front of me, standing on its hind legs. Its hoofs, not hoofs, at all, but three-pronged talons, like a chicken's feet. It was nodding and licking its face, with its thick, forked tongue. I was afraid. Then it turned and barked, and another one, out of the herd, headed down the slope. The thing gestured with its chicken's feet. Hunters, it said, pointing down the slope. The firing began again. It took some time to work my way down the slope on the forested right side. It would cover my movement until I got about 60 feet from the bottom tower. As I got closer and closer, I could make out hunters in the bottom tower, wearing camouflage hats and drinking beer, piling around, firing as the creatures danced and whirled on their track down the slope. When the creatures reached the bottom, they would circle around the tower and canter back up the slope on the forested side. One after another galloped past me, each coughing my name as they ran past. When I got to the limit of the pines down the slope, it was maybe an hour or so from dawn. The hunters were paying no attention to me now. I opened the tower door slowly. A Coleman lamp hung from a nail on the wall. To my left, the closet door was open. Browning fluorescent lights illuminated a room with slick red walls. Inside were corpses of the fangs. They were hanging upside down from meat hooks, chittering, scurrying crab-like fangs made quick work out of the flesh. Long, pointed arms extended out sixfold from a white and blue carapace. Beady black eyes poked out on each side of a mouth with pointed mandibles and odd, glistening red tubes. There were three of them in there, clattering of the deer or whatever they were, and picking them clean. I shot all three in quick succession, and they fell dead, quivering spasmodically. I noticed later, with a quick glance, that one of the things hanging from a meat hook was actually a person, wearing a tattered black jumpsuit. Above me, I could hear the hunter scrambling. I turned the Coleman lamp down, and could see the glare of the light from the upper level of the tower, shining down into the stairwell. As they came down, I shot each of them, one at a time. Three bodies lined the stairwell, and blood and brain painted the wall behind them. They were all carrying heavy hunting rifles, and had little hats that looked like the crab things on them. One stayed up there. I could hear him, pacing. There was another noise too, a kind of light squeaking. The hunter was not saying anything. I shuffled over to the door, squeaked it open, then carefully closed it shut while remaining inside. Then I crawled under the shelves and pointed my sig up. He called down. He was saying the hunter's name, it sounded like. Then, slowly, he poked his head 
out from under a metal railing over the stairs and swept his head back and forth. Then he began to tiptoe down. I shot him in the throat and he fell gurgling. When I stepped over him, he made to grab at my feet and I shot him again. Upstairs, I stopped at the landing and saw a dozen little crab things skittering around in a panic. I had to reload, but I managed to shoot all of them, and then I crushed them under my boots too. Then I went through the wallets of the dead men and went outside. There was one of them out there. He looked at me and barked my name and went back up the slope. Before I went home, I filled out my assay sheet under workplace accidents. I listed the names of each of the hunters, and under miscellany, I wrote, 15 deceased crustaceans, origin unknown. In additional notes, I wrote in big block letters, I quit.